Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Rather, I lied. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to pick up in verse 10 here in just a second and continue with our sermon series, A Father's Warning. As many of you know, I worked prior to converting to Christianity, prior to going to school and becoming a minister. As many of you know, I worked as a paramedic. And before that, I worked as a medic for a long time. And I'll never forget one call. Um, it was shortly after my father, I used to have this black watch that my father bought for me. I, I still have it, but I had this black watch that I used to wear all the time that my father bought for me when I passed my paramedic exam, when I became a paramedic. And I used to wear that watch all the time because it had all these different dials on it that were very useful. You know, for example, Believe it or not, when you call 911, we've got a whole process, a whole scheme that we're following, a system that we're following. And, and one of those things is when we get on scene, we only want to be on scene for about 10 minutes. If we're on scene longer than 10 minutes, then that's, there's something up, you know, and it does happen occasionally. So we're timing those types of things, and we're watching for those types of things. Anyway, I rotated out of the Coastal Bend area. I don't remember what the occasion was, but they wanted me to work a shift down in the Rio Grande Valley. And of course, that's where I lived, so it was a lot easier to work there. It was a lot easier to get to the shift, and it was a 24-hour shift. And in the middle of the night, somewhere around 11 p.m., I suppose, we got a call. A gentleman was walking in the dark in the middle of a county, on the middle of a county road, and a car hit him going about 50. And we showed up, and if you don't know what happens to the human body when it get hit, gets hit by a, a fast-moving, large, heavy object like a vehicle, when I say it's not pretty, it's really an understatement. But I'm not going to get too much into the graphics. Needless to say, this man was injured, and he was covered in blood. Now, we've got to life flight him out. We're far enough away from the trauma center that would handle this type of trauma that we've, we've got to fly him out. And so we're on that county road in the middle of nowhere working this patient with barely any lights. We've got to get him on a backboard. We've got to put a seat collar on him. And I'm the one who's responsible for getting this patient from his twisted up position on the road to being supine, laying flat on a backboard, ready for the helicopter. And I've got my hands underneath, underneath his head, holding his shoulders. And I've got that watch that my father just got me. And it's right there, and the glove comes right up to here, and it doesn't cover that watch. And we're working that patient, and we finally finish. And I'm looking at my hands, patients flying away. My hands are covered in blood from the tips of my fingers to my elbows. My gloves come to here, and I see bits and pieces of hair in my watch. It was a hard thing. It was a horrible thing. It was a traumatic thing. I'm going to leave that story there. I'll come back to it. Lord willing, I'll remember to come back to it. Um, I'm going to come back to it, but Jesus has this interesting thing he says in the Gospels. You know, contrary to popular belief, everyone always likes to talk about how the Gospel is about faith, right? You're saved by faith alone, is what all of these people will tell you. It's unfortunate that we don't see that in the Bible. What the Bible actually says is you're saved by grace alone, which is God's willingness to offer us something we don't deserve. That's grace. But all these people would say, well, you're saved by faith alone. And they describe this faith as a mere mental acknowledgement, this mere idea that I believe that Jesus existed at some point, that he died and that he rose. And because I acknowledge that fact, I am now a Christian. Contrary to popular belief, Jesus describes discipleship. He describes being a Christian in a very different way. He says things like this. If you don't hate your father and your mother, your brother and your sister, if you don't love me more than them, you're not worthy of being my disciple. In another place, he'll tell his apostles and his disciples in the first century, if you're not willing to die to yourself, pick up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy 
to be my disciple. You see, the Word of God is in contention with what is often said and what is often believed today. The Word of God is great in great contention. This is why we're in 1 Corinthians. This is why we're going verse by verse through this book. This is why we study the way we do, church. Because it's so easy to fall prey to the enemy. It's so easy to fall prey to our own flesh and our own desires. It's so easy to fall prey to what we want to be true rather than what is. This is why the scriptures remind us that the the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Or there is a way that seems right to a man, but its way ends in death. The understanding of the scriptures is that we bring what we think we know, we bring what we think we understand, we bring our perspectives and our beliefs, and we make them subject to the Word of God. So with that said, let's get into the Word of God this morning. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to be starting in verse 10, but I'm going to be referring to some of the things we've talked about last week. So if you'll open your Bible there, please, thank you. All right, so Paul says, these are the things, this is verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, these are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. Stop. There are a lot of pronouns in this section, okay? Okay. There are a lot of references back to things Paul has said in the previous argument. First with, we look at these, these are the things. What are the things? The gospel things, redemption, reconciliation, salvation, resurrection from the dead. These are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirit. Stop. Many people will tell you and many people want you to believe that this revealed to us is only in reference to the apostles. I disagree. If we look back up in the text, the closest thing, the closest next reference we have in this vein is in verse 9, where Paul says, however, as it is written, what no eye has seen and what no ear has heard and what no human mind has conceived. This is, of course, the gospel, redemption, the coming of the kingdom of God, reconciliation, sanctification, justification, all of those big words. What no mind has conceived, the things God has prepared. For who? If you look in the text, for those who love him. Church, it is this us that Paul is referring to in this passage. Those who love God. So he says, these are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirit. And he did. He did reveal these things by His Spirit. He revealed them in the ministry of Jesus Christ. He revealed them in the Gospel. Because what is it that we learn in the Gospel? Consider yourself an ancient Greek sitting back in this world. And you hear that it is by the Spirit of God, the things of God are revealed. What is it that you're going to think? What is it? What is it the things that are revealed about Zeus? What are the things that have been revealed about Homer? What are the things that have been revealed about all of the Greek gods? Horror, evil. Zeus was a rapist. If you know anything about mythology, you know Zeus and the horrible things that he did. The other gods are no better. But what are the things that are revealed about our God? What does the gospel reveal about our God? That he loved us so much that he took on human flesh. That he cared for mankind so much that he did not abandon him in his time of need, but rather set about to redeem and save him. These are the things that have now been revealed, not just to the apostles, Certainly, no one is discounting that. Our scripture reading this morning from John chapter 14, there is no doubt that God chose the apostles as witnesses of the ministry of Christ, as witnesses of the voice of God at Jesus' baptism, as witnesses of the voice of God on the Mount of Transfiguration, as witnesses of his death and his burial and his resurrection. There is no doubt that God chose them to be his witnesses. And he gave them his spirit for a unique ministry. There's no doubt, but that's not what this is talking about. Paul is looking at the Corinthian church and he's saying, we have that same spirit. Every single one of us here. And it is through that spirit, the character, the love, 
the justice, the holiness of God has been revealed. You know it. Because he called you. Isn't that exactly what he said in this chapter? Go back up and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 2. It's the argument that he's been making. Not many of you were wise. Not many of you were strong. Not many of you had, were of noble birth. But God chose the weak things. The weak things of this world to reveal what? To reveal who he is. Church, so often, so often, people mischaracterize our God. That he's a bully, or he's mean, or he's evil. He causes bad things to happen. He causes strife and destruction in my life. He he's the cause of... No, he's not. God has worked tirelessly, tirelessly from creation forward to save us. To forgive us. I stand before you today, church, a flawed and broken man. That's who I am. Do you think I deserve to be here? Do you think I somehow earned this? If you knew half of who I was, if you knew but half of who I was, church, you would tar and feather me and send me screaming from this building. I don't deserve to be here. But that's what the Corinthians are struggling with. See, they have forgotten what has been revealed to them by His Spirit. See, the Spirit searches, this is in verse 10 continuing, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. In other words, this, who is it that knows you best? If you, if you, if you were, wanted to know more about me, a really easy person that you could ask is Dan Spaeth or James Coburn or Dan Marshall because I spend a lot of time with them. But what if you, really, if you wanted to know the deep things about me? If you wanted to know the things that nobody, who would you go to? You could go to my wife. And if she's a good wife, which she is, she will tell you to buzz off. Please. I don't deserve that, but please. Um, but even the things, how about the things my wife doesn't know? The things that keep me up at night, the things that I vex over, the things that I know that I struggle with in my soul and that I hate and that I cannot stand and that I wish were gone from my life. What about those things? Does my wife know those things? Some, some she does. Some she doesn't. This is going to be a wonderful Mother's Day for us, by the way. Um, no, but seriously, who knows the thing to who we really are but ourselves? That's what this is talking about. See, we have the Spirit of God, and it's been revealed to us. All of the good things of God, and the Spirit knows the truth because it is God's Spirit. I mean, do we remember John? I mean, this was the whole purpose of the coming of the kingdom of God and redemption and forgiveness and all these things, that we might be one, that God might be all and in all. And so we have this testimony of God, this very truth about the nature of God and the things that he has sought, not our destruction, but our salvation. And how do we have it? We have his very own spirit that tells us this is true. We have this spirit that testifies to us. Romans chapter, I believe it's Romans chapter 8, Paul will say that the spirit of God testifies on our behalf that we belong to God. And so Paul says, we can be sure because the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, and that what we have received is not the Spirit of the world. And if you've been here for the whole series, or if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians, you know that Paul has held up this Spirit of the world, this wisdom, these other things as an anti-type. And this, the Spirit of God, godly wisdom, the things that have been, been revealed that the world considers foolishness, that as a contrary type, is something that's in contention with one another. What Paul is saying here is what we've received from God is his spirit, therefore we have not received the spirit of the world. And what is the spirit of the world? In their day and age, it was about these, I, this idea that all people have this spirit, this breath in them 
that all people are really one. That all, if you've ever listened to any new age crystal guru today, that's not new. They've been saying that for 2,000 years. The Greek philosophers were coming up with that stuff a long time ago. A heretical sect of Christians known as Gnostics took it and ran with it. And it still influences our thinking today. But the spirit of the world that we, rather, the spirit of God is not that spirit of the world. Not what they are talking about. What really is the spirit of the world? Who is the God of this world, church? The rebel? Is he not? Is he not the enemy? Does he not seek to confuse and deceive? Does he not come after? See, it's not that spirit that we've received. That's the spirit that encourages strife and chaos. That's the spirit that encourages all of the problems that's going on in Corinth, right? All of the issues that we've already started to see, the elevation of human teachers over and against one another, the sexual immorality that we'll deal with, all of the struggles that they've dealt with in Corinth, they come from the spirit of the world. But the spirit who's from God, it says in verse 12, uh, we have received the spirit who is from God so that, notice what he says here, we may understand what God has freely given us. And thus begins an area of text here that is wholly debated. Depending on the tradition of Christianity that you listen to or you subscribe to, the next few verses mean, have been interpreted to mean something they simply do not and cannot. What I mean is this, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. What is that? Grace, redemption, forgiveness, reconciliation, justification, sanctification, eventually salvation, resurrection of the dead. Those are the things that Paul has in view here. And we have this spirit so we may understand the authenticity that they've been given in, but also so that we may embrace them. Look at verse 13. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom. You can go ahead and perfect, thank you. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. Understand that in verse 13, what we're looking at is truth. The truth of God, the truth of His message, the truth of salvation. We're looking at truth. And this doesn't come from clever devices. This doesn't come from what Paul calls human wisdom. This human wisdom that each one of us really are gods. And we will eventually go back up into that great spirit in the sky and be gods with him. That stuff right there, that's what the philosophers were teaching. Where does that lead? That leads to division. That leads to false teaching. That leads to all of the evil that the church in Corinth is doing. But rather, we speak not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining the spiritual realities of the gospel with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept, this is verse 14, the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. What this doesn't mean is that you have to have the Spirit of God to understand the gospel. That's what so many people who come through this section of text believe it means. That is not what it means. You know how I know? Faith comes by hearing and hearing what? The Word of God. But wait, they don't have the Spirit yet, preacher. I've got a couple men on the back pew back there that we sat down and studied with. That I sat down and went over the gospel. I went over back. I went over all of those things. We talked about all of those things. Brothers, I hope you don't mind. But we're going to talk about it just a little bit. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. That last session, my family left. They went to Houston. My, uh, my niece was having a birthday party. But I didn't want to cancel that session, that study. Because I knew, I knew what we had studied. I knew what we had talked about. I knew where they were and what God was doing in their lives. And so we sat down to study and two things that I thought was very interesting. Mind you, we're talking about what is baptism and what is it for. One of our brothers said this, I need a new conscience. 
I just know I need a new conscience. Another one said, I need, I need a new lease on life. I need a new life. And if you know what baptism is, then you know in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Peter will say, and baptism now saves you. Not the, removal of, uh, not the removal of filth from flesh, you're not taking a bath, but the appeal or the pledge to God of a clean conscience. You know Romans chapter 6 that says this, that all of us who died with Christ were buried with him and raised to walk in newness of life. Both of these brothers were already there. They didn't have the Spirit yet, but they understood. You see, Paul looks at the church and he says, you can understand the mystery of Christ by reading what I have written. No need for the Spirit. Now, do I believe that the Spirit is at work? Absolutely. The Spirit and the Word, uh, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is sharper than any double-edged store, sword and pierces bone and marrow and flesh. Levels every argument. But what this doesn't say is that you have to have the Spirit of God to understand what the Bible says. Or that the Spirit of God is going to interpret what the Bible says for you. It's not what this passage says at all. If it did, why did Paul write any letters at all? Did they not have the Spirit of God in Corinth? So where's the confusion coming from if they have the Spirit of God to lead them into all truth? How can Paul warn the Galatian church and the Philippian church about false teachers and Judaizers? If, I mean, after all, if they have the Spirit of God, there's no threat of false teaching because we have the Spirit of God that makes all things known. Church, I submit to you that these Corinthians, we're going to get into some of the things they were doing, and I guarantee you they weren't doing it by the Spirit of God. Or do we think our God is an author of confusion? No. So I've said what it isn't. What is it? The person with the Spirit, let's keep coming down to 14 and 15. The person with the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned or rightly judged only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgment about things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgment. What this is talking about, church, is behavior. What this is talking about is behavior. You see, the Corinthians are claiming, well, we have the Spirit of God. We have the gift of prophecy. We have the gift of all knowledge. Paul's already acknowledged that they do. But instead of allowing that knowledge of the cross, that knowledge of the things that God has done, that knowledge of who God has made them to be, instead of allowing that knowledge to change them, to grow them, to mature them, instead, they've turned and devoured each other and fought with one each other, with each other, and tore each other down. What Paul, is saying is here, what Paul is saying here is you can't grab on and live out what God has done without the Spirit of God. Turn it to the last slide. It says in verse 15, the person with the Spirit makes judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ, it's not talking about something you accept. It's not, let me rephrase, it's not solely talking about something that we accept. It's not a proposition to be picked up off the table, but it is something to be lived out. You see, what Paul is saying is, you Corinthians, you have all these things, and you think you're mature, but you are not. Why? Look at chapter 3. What does he say? Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit. What are you talking about? He hasn't said anything about living by the Spirit. Yes, he has. We have the mind of Christ. The expectation, church, is that those who understand who our God is and what he has done for us ought to put it into practice. That's what this is talking about. And we know that's the case because chapter 3, verse 1 exists. After he makes this point, after he, after he says, hey, 
It's, we're supposed to have the Spirit of God. We're supposed to be grabbing on to this stuff. What does he say? Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. Mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, you are not are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? Even though they have the Spirit of God, they're still messing it up. Go ahead and go to the last slide. Understand, church, that the gospel of our Lord Jesus... I almost forgot. When I had the um, privilege to work as a paramedic in the state of Texas, I had many patients, not just that one man, many patients who bled on me, who vomited on me. I had patients who spat on me because they were upset and angry at what we were doing because they were desperate in their delusional state to have one last drink or in their delusional state to do something that would harm them or someone else. You know, in all the time I worked in the, in the ER, and all the time I worked on the ambulance, I never once looked at any of those sick, wounded, broken people and got upset because I was inconvenienced by them. I had one time, I was in the ER one time, and there's a gentleman who came in, and he had a, a traumatic pneumothorax, and the doctor was pushing on his chest for something, and I'm starting an IV, and a piece of his lung flies out of his chest and lands in my hair. I wasn't angry at him. It wasn't his fault. They're sick. Consider what real maturity is, church. Now turning to us, brothers and sisters, consider what real maturity is. Can we tolerate one another? Can we deal with one another? Can we remember that we are one body with one Lord? And that our command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Can we remember that, the thing, that when our brothers and sisters get upset and get angry and start throwing tantrums and doing all these silly things, can we remember that they're also children of God? Or do we get upset and do we get angry? Do we cross our arms and go, do you know what he or she said? Do you know what he or she has done? Brothers, sisters, look in the mirror. What have we done? And yet our God still offers us grace. He still offers us forgiveness. He still offers us another chance. So this morning, brothers and sisters, if you've forgotten that this is what the gospel really is all about, if you have forgotten the nature of our God and his call to us to live, to grab onto who he is and live it out, in unity with one another. If you struggle with that, if you've forgotten that, or if you're here this morning and you have trouble, you struggle to understand this gospel or what God has done on your behalf, you believe that there is no forgiveness for you, or you're confused about the nature of our discipleship, I want to talk to you. We have elders standing up in the back. I'm going to be back there in that prayer room. I ask that you come if, when we, as we stand and as we sing.